is what he's famous for, and we'll say, and you know, uh, Pedro Domingo, and then you'll say a little bit about yourself, and then we'll kind of <clears throat> go from there. But first, I have a little story to kind of prime this discussion. Yeah. And and you'll recognize it. Hang on. So, do you uh, you want to you want this recorded, uh, Corey? You want this? I want what recorded. Do you this little story? Yeah. Should I be recording now? Is what I'm asking. Well, I you know, is there anything that we need to get out of the way before we hit the recording button? I don't know. Can you talk about uh, well, just for my my reference uh, goals with with the podcast? Like just just. Uh, do you provide any of that intro? How you guys started? How we started this podcast? Yeah. Uh, well, I think it started what during COVID, and basically, mm -hmm. you know, we weren't we weren't around um, <laughs> intellectually curious people to the same extent that we were before. Like, for example, I used to go to what are called rationalist meetups, and so Pastor and I would have all these conversations, and mm -hmm. I think he was just bored one day he could probably tell you better than I can and then he just decided to he, he made a website and he just put all the technical work into actually making it happen uh, so Pastor what, what's the story from your end yeah I, I know that's pretty much the story there's, yeah. there's not much to it we're kind of yeah. just wandering around I mean I think we're still trying to sort of create a theme and a brand um, and it's, it's somewhat taking shape but um, it's evolving yeah. All right. All right. So you can, if there's nothing else, we can, yeah. we can, yeah. you can hit record, and I'll just read a brief little story. Um, this meeting is being recorded. It's your birthday. The year is 2042. Amazon dominates all areas of commerce. Some friends come over, holding a pink square box. You open it, seeing a black forest chocolate cake. Wow, this looks just like the ones my mom used to make, you exclaim. Your friend's eyes bulge out, mouths hanging agape. You realize what you've done, dreading you weren't too loud. But your fears are confirmed. Your Alexa chimes, according to the terms of use, gendered language is hate speech and speech is violence. You'll be unable to purchase anything for one week. Your food orders have been canceled. Your refrigerator will be locked for 48 hours. Next time, we will alert the police. Have a nice day. <laughs> this is the future that we want to avoid. So we are today talking about decentralization of technology, and we have three wonderful guests. Uh, we have Marcin Jakubowski. Marcin. Can you introduce yourself briefly? Yeah. So I'm known for the Global Village. You're on uh, mute, Marchin. Oh. All right, everybody. So my name is Marchin. So I started the Global Village Construction Set, a project called Open Source Ecology. So we design and open source blueprints for civilization. What does it look like to have the core infrastructure technologies to create a modern standard of living? Uh, and effectively do it from local resources. So, so radical decentralization. We actually say down down to any small parcel, like 40 acres. We're claiming that oh, you have rocks, sunlight, plants, soil, water. Hey, that's where all the wealth of the world comes from. Let's try to see if we can create that into that advanced standard of living. So that's a technological challenge, but much more. It's also a, a social challenge to how you get people to that level of possibility. So that's what I do for a living. And yours is a, a fascinating story. We, like everyone else on this panel, all you are previous guests, and uh, if anyone's interested, please listen to the podcast we had with Marchin. It's, it's incredible what he's doing out there, I think, in what, Missouri? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next, we have Pedro Domingos. Pedro, please introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, my specialty is artificial intelligence and in particular machine learning. Uh, I've done a bunch of research on this and helped start various areas uh, over time, like uh, things like um, influence maximization and adversarial learning. Uh, I'm probably best known as the author of The Master Algorithm, which is an introduction to machine learning 
uh, for a broad audience that surprisingly became a worldwide bestseller. Mm. And one of the, uh, sadly, one of the lone voices in academia that's standing up for sanity. Um, yeah. You, I think our listeners, if they haven't already, please listen to that episode as well. I think that was great. And then last but not least, George Haas. George, please introduce uh, yourself. Hey, I'm, I'm George. Uh, I come from old school hacker culture. Uh, you know, hack the planet, information should be free. Uh, I work on open source self-driving cars, and it turns out that most of the software you need to drive a car is actually also the software you need to drive a person. So probably over the next 10 years, we're going to build uh, open source people. Hmm. Uh, well, we might we might need to have a further episode with hmm. you to, to talk about that. That seems like a giant can of worms. Uh, but the first question, and just please feel free, uh, we'll just say, Martin, we'll just randomly pick you to start the answer first, but everyone else, please feel free. Uh, talk about the, the need or desire for decentralization of technology or a parallel economy. You can also touch on the, the dangers of mm -hmm. centralization, if that's easier framing. Yeah, I mean, yesterday we saw the, some, some plan blow up in Russia regarding something related to the war, with, and they were making some chemicals that are apparently quite necessary for the war effort and there was an article on Twitter saying, hey, uh, their war machine might stop because they're, they're missing some key central ingredients that they don't have because they focus on a centralized approach to produce everything. So when we talk about decentralization, the key is options, uh, resilience, a regenerative nature of an economy that's distributed, um, serving needs in a much more effective way. So. It's really about options, choices that people have in their own hands as opposed to relying on big systems. The, the Alexa episode that you read at the beginning is, <laughs> makes me laugh, but it's kind of the world we live in. We have the opportunity to be completely free, and I believe part of that freedom is distributed, decentralized, open source economies that simply provide and solve the last remaining question. Like, what is the last remaining question that the economy has not solved? And that's distribution the wealth is not evenly distributed, that's not getting better. Uh, so that's a critical missing link towards the prosperity of all because we have the technology for the technology and know-how and energy uh, to have a prosper prosperous life for everybody. And that starts with actually first principles. So if you look at it, there's about 10,000 times more power that comes from the sun than we use in the current global economy. Now that's from first principles, that's a case that says, oh, okay, we have plenty of energy. If you can trap it in things like solar energy or renewable energies, um, there is no issue in terms of material or energy scarcity and therefore prosperity for the entire planet. But that kind of a future must be centralized, distributed, not, not controlled by certain individuals who now hold the power and then kind of trickles down to the rest of society. So that's, that's my, my take. Pedro, George, please feel free to, to jump in with anything you have to say about this. Yeah, I, you know, w one reaction I have to, to this topic in general and, and to what Martin just said is that um, uh, decentralization is not an, an alloy good, right? Uh, neither is obviously centralization. Uh, the question of, of how centralized or decentralized to be does not have a yes or no answer. And it's not even a question of a point on a spectrum is that some things work better with greater degrees of decentralization and some things the other way around. And also something I think very important that you know I have a feeling we'll wind up bumping into is that there are dynamics uh, in the world, in society and in you know the economy and whatnot, that, and in politics that can favor one or the other. And, and you know, after you decide or we collectively decide what we like is good, then we have to worry about whether the dynamics is going in our direction or whether they have to make it go in the opposite direction. And then we have to realize that there's a fight that will, you know, always have to be fought. To make this all, you know, more concrete, you know, let me just give a very simple example, which I think is very topical today, which is, you know, does an army work better if it's centralized or decentralized, right? And a very centralized army does not work well. In fact, this is part of why, you know, supposedly Ukraine is, is being surprisingly uh, strong against Russia. And supposedly one of the strengths of the U.S. Army is that a lot of the decision-making power 
is down at the lieutenant platoon level, as a result of which, you know, it can be nimbler, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So centralized chains of command tend to be slow and have a disadvantage that way. On the other hand, a very decentralized army is actually not an army and does not win a war. It's just a bunch of independent guerrilla efforts that nev never add up to overwhelming the enemy. Right? So what what level to have in different respects, right? So you want the centralized decision making, but at the same time, you want what this lieutenant learned here to quickly pass to that lieutenant over there. This is something that the US learned in Iraq, right? Was to have these B boards where, you know, platoons would share what they had learned about combating IDs and whatnot. And, that, and, and you know, having, but, and, and at some point there's a lot of information that you do want to share with everybody. So, uh, you know, the, 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 if you look at a lot of organizations, and of course the army is at one extreme of the spectrum, but, you know, just any company, right? They, there's, a, there's, a, there's a reason they have a hierarchical organization, right? A hierarchy is really uh, things that are, centralized in degrees, right? There's local units that then, you know, uh, coordinate to larger units. And how we organize this in, in, in different areas is actually, I think, a very uh, interesting question with no easy, you know, answer, let's decentralize or let's centralize. So there's a lot so, there that I want to follow up on, but George. So the world has kind of trended towards centralization. Uh, maybe Modernism is the peak of this. We have our grand narratives. I'm a postmodernist. I don't believe in grand narratives. Um, I think the key thing is, and this is something that will, okay. Humanity used to live in tribes of 200, 150, 200 people. And that was Dunbar's the unit. Number, yeah. yeah. That was the unit that could support life. Um, now the unit that could support life is, in general, probably much larger. Um, how do you bring that number down to one? Uh, how do you make individual individual sovereignty is not a political question but a technical question people claim individual sovereignty but i see them wearing clothes well where did they get the clothes did they make them okay great where do you get the wool did you make it right like in order to truly decentralize the means of living uh you know you have to do that before you, anyone could ever claim individual sovereignty but once you have individual sovereignty everything else flows from there uh, so i just see it like that but i see it as a simple technical problem Right? If, if I have a box that can make me food, clothes, water, and shelter, well, then uh, what do I need the state for? Can you expand a little bit of, upon, upon that last part? So, the state, a lot of the way the state traps you, right? And the, 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 the state traps you by providing you with services. Um, the state maybe provides you, the two maybe we talk about healthcare and education, but the state provides you water, the state provides you power. If you could figure out how to replace the state with a better version, and not better because of ideology, you always lose if you're fighting ideological battles, but a better technical solution, cheaper power, better water, you know, uh, more available, stuff that's actually technically better than what the state is capable of providing, the state loses and freedom wins. And I think to focus on it as a technical question instead of a political question, might actually yield uh, might actually yield some results. Uh, unlike the you know the struggles that have gone on uh, for so long, politics is a huge waste of time. Technology is the only answer. So, but just just to interject something here, uh, please. Th there is something very important that we uh, need something like the state for, which is to protect ourselves against others. Right? People have studied things like, for example, the tribes in the Amazon. And, and they have an uncanny tendency to end up being the optimal size to overwhelm the tribes near them so they keep their territory uh, while not having, so, so you know, like, you don't want to divide your share of the wealth too much, but on the other hand, so there's, 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 there's a pull towards individualism, right? It's like, you know, you're sovereign, you take care of yourself, you, you know, you have, you know, sole access to whatever territory you want, but then you have to associate yourself with others so as not to get overwhelmed by the ones who would take it, right? And, and you know, if you aggregate yourself with more people, you get less of the, you know, of what you get, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, you get more, you know, versus the others, right? But again, and, and you could argue that just to finish yeah. my thought, the path from tribe to state, you know, the state is a larger tribe because the optimal size, because of technology, et cetera, et cetera, that you need, right, in order to defend yourself is now larger. 
Absolutely. And I think there's a very fundamental question about whether offense wins or whether defense wins. And if offense wins, I agree that this has to be true. But when you look at cryptography, it seems like defense wins. It seems like um, it is much harder to crack codes than it is to, uh, you know, make, you know, there, there actually are, if there actually are one-way functions in the world, then there's ways to defend yourself. Now, you can imagine, you know, very physically, you can imagine, like, let's say a force field. You know, I just put my force field up around my land and literally no one could get in. Hmm. Um, maybe you can't actually build that. But now if you imagine me, well, I'm actually, you know, in some homomorphically encrypted ZK Stark that's computing my brain function, uh, you know, maybe the state actually can't get into that. Maybe nobody can get into that. Um, so it is a fundamental question. And I agree with you that if offense wins, then maybe this isn't possible. But if you focus on places where defense wins, uh, I think that's the, uh, the, the fruitful place to explore. Defense yes, from what? Weather. Whether offense and defense wins actually varies by area, and it varies over time, right? Crypto yeah. is actually a great example. At, some, at various times, right now, yes, defense is winning, but yes. with quantum, it might, it might lose again. And, and, and it's hard to predict, and certainly in the past, one or the other, you know, like 200 years ago, you would have said that actually offense wins, but in different areas, right? Uh, if you look at military history, uh, you go through periods, and this, this has a huge impact, of course. You go through periods where offense or defense has the advantage. Uh, it's hard to envisage a world where defense has the advantage in every single area, and therefore I don't need to worry about you know uh, uh, joining with others, so to speak. Sure, uh, I think like there's also a question of like if we're truly in a post scarcity world, why would anyone attack you? Right? If you don't have state's <laughs> resources, well. Well, we are not in a post-scarcity world, and the, the answer to that is that, you know, human beings are this amazing creature that has an unlimited appetite, right? So we could have a million times more wealth than we do today, and people would still be talking about redistribution, and countries would still probably <laughs> sure. be invading each other and whatnot, because it's human nature, right? It's not, it, you know, the, there's always a limit of resources, and, and we will always be wanting more. You can try to educate people to want less. I think that's you know that's a valid approach. But uh, you know, um, no, I mean, I, I don't we think are in a post-scarcity world, and look look at all the scarcity around, and look at all the fighting, right? So you know, yes. the evidence is in. The thing that is scarce is power. You you can very easily make you know rice non-scarce, but it's. It, I think that in order to live off the grid in a decentralized way, I mean, this is even how I view my company. Uh, we renounce any desire for any power. Um, we don't want power. We dissociate ourselves from power. And therefore, I don't think that it's really worth attacking us. You might get some people who are just trolls who just want to attack to destroy things. But if you actually have like, okay, fine, you know, we could take over that guy's stuff. But if it's all the same worthless stuff that everybody has, uh, um, as you, long as that person... You know what Trotsky power. said, right? You may not be interested in politics, but politics is interested in uh, you. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how this plays out longer term. Well, clearly, people, clearly, this calls for human evolution, and that's kind of how we shifted our, our game. Uh, this goes into some of the limits of, okay, because obviously we have abundant resources, energy, well, energy, just first principles, 10,000 times more power from the sun. So first principles says we are okay, but humans have not evolved beyond the scarcity mindset of, of millions of years ago when we crawled out of the sea. So right now we're actually saying, okay, we're, we're gonna teach people how to produce things, but a core of that program will be psychosocial integration. How do we grow as humans? So that's the latest we've learned so far. The block that people think that we collaborate today uh, we're not. We're, we're very much competitive and all that. Like, uh, you can't make a good case. I don't think you can make a great case for open collaboration b being the way of the world. We have fighting and all this we're talking about right now. So we need to evolve as humans. So can technology help us do that? Well, the first prerequisite is meet humans' needs through abundance. Then we can start talking about human evolution. So that's my two cents. Are you talking about transhumanism? No, not necessarily. No, I mean, I'm talking about starting with basics. Maslow's hierarchy. Yeah. Basics. Right now, 
most people on this planet don't even have the basics met. If you talk about Russia, I, I come from Poland, right? So I came in 1982 when tanks were rolling down my streets. So actually this Ukraine thing is quite close, close to me. Um, but then I came to America and it was amazing. So, so in Poland, everything is like all gray, like real material scarcity. I had to wait in line to get things like, you know, for an hour to get butter or, or meat at the store. Things were rationed. So you gotta solve that first. Once we can solve this, we can free up people's time. And then you, you can question, well, what are gonna people do when, when they have ample spare time? But we have to start at the basics when then we can have people uh, actually start pursuing what's really important and meaningful to them because right now the promise of technology has not been delivered right we still work so hard and uh, we have not opened up our free time to do things that we really need so the first thing is we as a humanity need to meet human needs and then evolve to self-determination the ability for each person to do what exactly they like so that we can have a hope of a more peaceful society i want to pick up a, a little bit on what the with George, George's point that basically, well, uh, ultimately there's going to be people out there who want power, they want to dominate others, and mm -hmm. they will use centralized means to do so, and mm -hmm. so having decentralized uh, technologies or anything else is a way to kind of have some type of autonomy. And Marcin, you grew up uh, in Poland under communism. Pedro, you grew up in kind of bad times in Portugal. Can you both talk a little bit about how maybe this this shapes your views for the need for decentralization sure so uh, my, my first years of life I lived under a fascist dictatorship mm. um, I can't say that you know I was too small to really understand the full extent of it but then there was this revolution where you know the country veered towards communism and then back and you know I actually learned a lot during that period. And I think, uh, you, you know, so there's this central dilemma, which uh, is you need the state to protect you from, you know, the people who would kill you, but then the state will kill you, <laughs> right? So the question is like, how can you have such an organization while protecting yourself from it at the same time? And this is the problem that is, of course, in my view at least, not well solved by fascism or communism or other autocracies, right? Because there's a conflict of interest. So, so the rulers are maximizing their own utility, uh, uh, probably at the expense of the people, right? So you need this, so at the same time, you do need those, you know, some amount of centralization to make things work, you know, whether for defense or, or, or justice or, 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 you know, just to have the underpinning of markets and so on. Again, there's, there's a lot that we can talk about there. And, and technology does change it. But if we assume for us for a moment that you do need that, then you also have to answer the question, how do you prevent the people who are then in the position of being the rulers or the whatever you call them from, from exploiting you know, their position and oppressing you, which is what one way or another winds up happening in every autocracy, right? And I think the, you know, the good old US constitution is actually a very nice example of how do you do this kind of mechanism design, right? I think the problem with a lot of um, idealists, particularly on their left, is that they want to have a, a system of government that is based on the rosiest possible assumptions about human beings. If we were all just, you know, peace-loving, you know, brotherhood, kumbaya, uh, maybe socialism would work, but we aren't. The thing that the Founding Fathers obsessed about and very properly so, and, and, and with great success and with the beneficiaries, is uh, we need to have a system that will work even under the most pessimistic possible assumptions about human nature, right? Why if we have people who, because sooner or later you will, have someone in power who wants to take too much power, who wants to take advantage, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And this is where things like, you know, separation of powers and so on and so on uh, come from. So that, you know, if we, you know, I'm a computer scientist, like so uh, thinking in terms of mechanism design, I think comes very naturally, right? You can think of the constitution as being an algorithm for how to run things. And it was amazingly uh, insightful and the, the, the part of a lot of hard work for the time. I think, you know, of course, you know, it does have some bugs, 
But the, the interesting, I would even say fascinating question for us today is that with the technology that we have today, can we actually design something better? In particular, I think of interest you know, to this conversation, something that actually requires less centralization uh, where, where, while potentially delivering better results. And I think the answer to that is probably yes. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of experiments at various levels from cities to parties to whatnot, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, to lots of other things going on around the world. I don't think anything has really caught fire yet, but I think sooner or later will, it will. And mm -hmm. also, you know, just, you know, here's one thought to bear in mind. I think, you know, as a yeah, researcher, I see with a lot of worry how autocracies like China in particular are, you know, running full steam ahead with using AI, you know, to improve their autocracy and their ability to, you know, mm -hmm. surveil and, and repress the people. Uh, we, the democracies, have to start taking advantage of those technologies in some of these ways that I brought up uh, to improve ourselves because uh, if we don't, autocracy might win. Okay. Well, all these things, though, are political solutions. Like, I don't think that you'll ever win politically. Here, here's, here's my basic theory. And it's like, why do people want to oppress others? Why do people, well, where does that desire come from? And I think it basically comes from a desire for slaves. I think that 90% of people, if honestly asked, would love to have slaves, <laughs> right? They don't want to be a slave, they would love to have slaves, right? Sure. 10% of people think that it's morally wrong, whatever, 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 you'll never get the 10%. But out of the 90, I think that only 10% come from a real desire for domination and sadism. I think the other 80% are just lazy. And I think that's a problem that can be fixed technically. Why does a country care about oppressing its citizens if it can build 10 million robotic citizens that work more effectively and better than any real human does? Uh, well, George, I, do you think it's the need for just to you know, get stuff or is it more kind of a ultimately a need for safety and then if you have people under your thumb you just feel more safe? I think there's 10% of people where it actually does come from a desire to like, I am above these people, I feel good. But I think for 80% of people it's just like, yo, I mean, I don't want to mop the floor. <laughs> and I, Marcia, I, 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 I actually agree with that, that to a large degree in the following sense. I think if you do the following thought experiment, which I think is a good starting point, is less, ask everybody if they would like to be king of the world, right? Not slaves, but just the, the world exists to serve you, right? Most people, I'm guessing, would probably deep down or at least, or even very openly say, yeah, sure, right? Why not, right? Why not have the world serve me, right? But then, but then of course, and so then the slaves are just the means to that, then you're right, if you have robots, then you don't need the slaves, but also you need to protect yourself from others. And also I think that, you know, there's a social power, you know, because of this, right? There's the, you know, like in order to get resources, you need to dominate over others. And that sometimes winds up, you know, becoming its, its own goal. But bottom line, right? Oppressing people is actually very costly. Exactly. You get what you want without oppressing them. That's much preferable. In fact, one of the chief Maybe even the chief. There's many, but they, I think the chief, you know, uh, uh, the, you know, handicap of, of, of authoritarianism is the cost of oppressing people, which democracy does not have, or at least that's to a much lower degree. Yeah. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't really believe in democracy. I think all political systems are pretty much the same. They just explain themselves differently. Uh, but I think the thing that finally changes if we're going to be able to build machines that can do everything humans could do, and that's something that's never been true throughout all of human history. Yeah, I want to pick up a little bit. Oh, sorry, Martin, were you going to yeah, say something? Yeah, I was going to say uh, the word that comes up here that I think all of us could agree on is algorithms. So I design stuff like blueprints, but everything can be turned into eventually AI algorithms and it's capturing those rules of operation or how things work, the designs that are critical. So open sourcing, so creating and open sourcing effective algorithms, like whether it's governance, it's governance, things like governance, how does that actually play out? I think we can agree that that's, um, that's a common ground, that open source algorithms for how things work effectively. So we're all struggling with, well, how do you make given all these complexities in the world, how do you make the political or the technical work out? Mm, I, 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 I buy it. Algorithms. 
I buy into the basic neo-reactionary tenet that says we have become so much worse at political algorithms in the last 300 years. Like 300 years ago, people actually thought about this stuff because it was life or death. Now we live mm-hmm. in a technological paradise and, you know, we all push through stupid ideas and like, eh, it doesn't matter, you know? I want to tie something that um, that Pedro had, had mentioned a little bit to this. So Pedro talked mm-hmm. about, well, the Constitution was designed in in a way that, you know, so so idiots can basically run it. Um, and he, he talked about the separation of powers, and you often hear people talk about both the separation of powers, but then checks and balances. But these are, of course, antithetical, although most people just say them in the same breath. And the Constitution was designed not exactly for separation of powers, but that there's sharing of powers, such that no branch is able to conclusively determine the extent of their own powers, right? So you can't have just or at least it was designed, so you couldn't have just one branch just kind of dominate all the others. And I'm curious when it comes to, you know, technology and decentralization, uh, is it the case that, well, as long as there's a couple of different fiefdoms that, say, other platforms can't can't dominate, um, is that good enough? Question open to everyone. No, I wouldn't. I would say no. It's definitely not good enough. And in fact, you know, if you look at the internet, right, it started as this great decentralized dream, right? Something more decentralized than, and and you know, more, uh, you know, bottom up than 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 was ever possible before. And information wants to be free, and so on. And look where we are today, right? Where it's given rise to the the biggest. Uh, centralization of information in history, right? Uh, if you look at, you know, something like Google, right? Uh, there's never been that kind of concentration of information and of power over information, right? Like, you know, when people search for things, Google tells them what they find, right? Uh, and, and again, I, you know, I was mentioning the dynamics earlier, like, you know, there was a dynamics that made this happen. And the dynamics in this, you know, like, uh, is that for example, if you look at the AI and machine learning, if you have more data, you can learn more, and therefore you can do better, and therefore more people will use it, and there's this, you know, positive feedback loop, right? And and you could say that in many ways that positive feedback loop is a good thing, because we are now better served than we were before, right? But it also introduces certain dangers that you have to guard against. At the same time, right, uh, I mean, these days, Almost across the spectrum, you have these people saying that the big tech companies are evil because of their centralized power and whatnot. But but the thing to realize is that this centralization has actually gone hand in hand with decentralization at another level. So, for example, thanks to Google and Amazon, more small you know uh, authors, merchants, you know makers of things can now make a living than ever could before. So what we have was like. You know, we have this simultaneous centralization where there are these behemoths like Google and Amazon that actually support an enormous decentralization in that, like, anybody can sell things, anybody, anybody can put out, you know, a podcast, for example, uh, that will have, you know, an audience of people, you know, potentially arbitrary people around the world that couldn't before. So it's a very interesting dynamic how this can go in, 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 in both ways at once. When, when you said that, it reminded me, basically, it sounded almost like you said that the... Uh, all these platforms have almost created a new commons for people. Um, and I think 10 years ago, a lot of people saw that, oh, you know, it's great that Google has put all, the, all these things out for anyone to use. Uh, and all these platforms that appeared to be neutral, kind of like a commons was back in the day. Uh, but now they're kind of exerting themselves over these commons and people don't like that. They have, and in fact, I think you just said a word that is crucial to all of this, which is platform, right? A platform is actually, uh, by definition, something centralized, because otherwise it wouldn't be a platform, right? It would just be different platforms. But that creates, ideally, this, um, you know, even playing ground for very large-scale decentralization to happen. But then, of course, a lot of interesting things happen at the margins, or not even, they start at the margins of, so the platform is centralized, like Amazon or Google. The users, like the merchants and the you know the buyers, as well, are very decentralized, like never before. But then the question becomes, where does the platform end and the user begin? Or like the you know the, the 
you know, think of even an operating system, right? Like, is the browser part of the operating system, right? Or like the platform is content moderation part of the platform? Once content mod and your know, content moderation didn't need to be part of the platform when the platform was small, you know, think of all this social media, right? At some point, the content moderation becomes absolutely essential because there's too much information for it to work without content moderation. But at that point, it's no longer just a platform. It actually has started to be a centralized thing, right? The Twitter algorithm is a centralized thing. So uh, uh, there's an interesting tension between these two things. The notion that these platforms are like powerful or monopolies just never seemed true to me. If you think about the railroad or the electrical grid, these are centralized monopolies that would cost you know, huge amounts of resources to reproduce. The minute someone makes a search engine better than Google, they'll take over the search engine market in five years, right? I wrote a blog post about vampire attacking Twitter. I think with a billion dollars, you could take over Twitter. Right? You don't need to buy Twitter. You just move all the, you incentivize all the people to move to basically a copy of the platform. Switching costs are very cheap for these things. Um, so I'm not worried about platform dominance at all. And I agree with you very much that they've enabled way more decentralization than centralization. Well, George, I mean, there's it, also network effects yeah. that you, you might be ignoring. Oh, so you can overcome network effects by incentivization or like liquidity attacks. So like the famous one in crypto is that like SushiSwap took all the liquidity from Uniswap by basically incentivizing the LPs. But how hard would it really be to incentivize, you know, the 10,000 top people on Twitter to move somewhere else? Uh, um, very, very hard, actually. So I, I you know, uh, I, I, I actually agree with you that, and this is, I think, not widely appreciated, that it, it's quite possible to create a search engine that beats Google or, you know, a social network that beats Twitter and whatnot. But I think you are greatly underestimating the difficulty. The problem with Google is, like, I mean, 20 years ago, we used to think like, oh yeah, like anybody can make another Google. It's just a search box. It's easy to switch. It's not like Windows where, you know, you'd have to throw out all your software. But now we know, you know, as Corey was mentioning, there's the network effect of data, right? You know, you, you, you know, you know, Google has, you know, well, 10 orders of magnitude more data than you. So your ranking learning algorithm has to be 10 orders of magnitude better for you to compete with it. And, and that is not available, right? So, so, you know, like if you, I, you know, I've talked to folks at Bing who say, and I actually, you know, uh, agree with them from what I've seen, that technically Bing is actually uh, comparable to Google or better, but that they, they have no hope. They've given up on ever trying to, you know, dethrone Google because the advantage that Google gets from the extra data that it has and therefore producing better search results is just too big. Same thing with Twitter. You know, like I, I remember talking with, with, with a guy who, who was like Twitter's uh, chief scientist or chief media scientist or, or something, uh, and, and you know, a few years ago, and he said something that stuck in my mind, which was that like Twitter has survived multiple attempts by management to destroy it. It's like Twitter is so resilient because the people are so invested in it. You have spent all that effort accumulating followers. Yeah. Right? And you're not going to start again from scratch somewhere no. else. And of course you're not. And this is why in the Twitter case, what you'd have to do is you'd have to copy the graphs, right? Like you'd scrape Twitter's entire graph. You'd put Twitter's graph somewhere else. It's basically identical to use, but you get incentivized uh, to tweet. I also think that, of course, Bing is never lets you. Well, Twitter can't stop me. Right? I'll do it in a decentralized way. I'll put a browser plugin on, you know, 10,000 people's computers who want to opt in and earn some free Twitcoin. Um, I don't think Twitter could, could, could stop that because it's indistinguishable from using the service. But <laughs> Bing will never beat Google because Bing is even, but it's not Google. Like they built the same thing. They built a box. You're never going to build a better box than Google. But could you build a NLP, uh, you know, uh, to do what I mean engine that beats Google? Yeah, it'll have to be well, something Well, that's, else, that's right? funny you should say that because that was actually the big push at Bing in the early days, you know, of Steve Ballmer. I mean, I knew the people working on this. It was exactly, we are going to beat Google by being an NLP-driven, you know, dialogue, ask me questions engine. That was their whole idea of how they were going to beat Google, and they didn't. Well, maybe the tech wasn't there yet, right? Yeah, like, for sure. I mean, it's how many, <laughs> well, yeah, 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 but like, okay, serious question. How many more years before we pass the target? 
No, I mean, uh, uh, the, the Turing test is meaningless. It's already been passed in, in many meaningless ways. And then, but I mean, without, without going there, I think the question of when will the technology be there is a good one. But the thing to realize is that no one understands that better or is pushing more on that technology or is farther advanced in it than Google itself. Yeah, but maybe. And if Google actually manages to deliver a better product by innovating, then they deserve their market dominance. My point is, there's a limit to how shitty Google can become. Right? Every, <laughs> no, time, I mean, they wanna, every time they want to modify the ideal objective function to put in their ideas about content moderation, well, you know, they're crippling themselves. How much can they do that? No, I mean, uh, uh, think about the following, right? Uh, Google rose to prominence because of, it was doing page rank instead of just TFIDF, right? And page rank is a quintessential decentralized algorithm. The whole idea of page rank that made Google successful is that the best source for whether a page is good is the people who decide to point to it or not. Sure. And then the people who point to those and whatnot. So Google is powerful because it's a decentralized search engine. The, the computation happens in a centralized fashion, but doesn't need to, right? Like, that's almost like a secondary technical issue. The point <laughs> is that Google is powerful because it has everybody's brain working on ranking uh, the, the, the pages, as opposed to TFIDF, where, you know, you're just looking at the keywords on the page. Mm -hmm. uh, question, yeah, but for, I mean, question for you guys, though. So do you, like Pedro, do you think that Google will go down at some point? Or no, it's, it's there forever? Oh, I think Google will inevitably go down at some point. Uh, I think all these, you know, uh, I, I, I have, uh, I cast a skeptical eye on all these like antitrust, you know, lawsuits against tech companies and threats of them because they always end the same way, which is, you know, the company loses its dominance before the antitrust lawsuit runs its course and wastes exactly. millions of dollars. And all of these tech companies, this I think is an interesting, you know, uh, uh, question for us. Uh, and, and, and many others is they are all actually very vulnerable in many ways that people do not appreciate. Uh, Google is one of them. So what are a couple of the ways in which Google is very vulnerable? One is that if I come up, you know, Google can only, you know, they try to corner the market in machine learning researchers and that they almost did at one point. Now, now, now it's impossible. And, you know, sooner or later, someone is going to come up with a machine learning algorithm that is a hundred times better than theirs. And at that point, I only need a hundredth of the data to be competitive, right? And they understand this, right? They are terrified of this, but mm -hmm. sooner or later it will happen. This is one aspect. Another aspect is that they make their money by targeting ads, right? And, and, and there are, you know, ad blockers, like, there are many interesting, you know, arms races going on in the world right now, in technology in particular. And one of them is, but, but, but this one actually is surprisingly uh, in its early stages when it shouldn't be, is between ad blockers and ad sellers, right? But, you know, we were talking about offensive defense. Actually, I think in the long run, the ad blockers, once they get their act together, uh, have the advantage. And then the business model of Google and Facebook collapses because they can't make money anymore, right? So this is mm -hmm. another mortal threat pointed at the threat of Google. And you could mm -hmm. say the same thing in different ways about each of the others. Ads, ads is another form of where you are deviating from the ideal function, right? What, what, what you, the ideal function of what the person actually wants. Well, you're not just taking that into account. You're also taking into account what Dyson Vacuums wants when they bought this ad, right? So, so they're already like they're already you know suboptimal, right? Could I I could build the same thing as Google, put no ads on it, and people probably use it. No, no, no. But wait, wait a second. Like in the original PageRank paper, right, by by Brennan Page. They said something very interesting. They said, you know, this technology will probably make advertising obsolete. Their whole idea at Google in the beginning was, was what you're just saying, that ads won't be necessary anymore. Because and nobody will just search for what they want. And then they had to, you know, switch to having ads in order to, among other things, just support themselves. Right? And in 2010, Google Ads were not that bad. It was one little thing in a clearly colored box at the top of the page. Now, well, they're paying to manipulate the search results practically. No, I, I agree. So again, beautiful example of, of, of how the dynamics plays out, right? If you look, for example, at the fraction of the real estate on a search page that is yep. occupied by real search results versus ads, right? 
it's tending to zero as time progresses. It's a joke right? on mobile. You got to scroll through two pages before you Pre get to precisely, the result. Precisely. And what this means is that, again, this makes Google vulnerable to someone who basically yeah. says, no, I'm just going to have fewer ads again, right? They, they have this reward function that causes them to, to step by step with great resistance put more and more ads at some point. Uh, again, I think it's hard for them to fight that, but at some point creative destruction comes into play, and you're right, they get bad enough that somebody else, you know, who has a good enough algorithm, maybe better whatnot, but also gives you less ads and less, you know, uh, more honest search results, if you will, uh, uh, wins over them. But again, Google in the beginning, the whole don't be evil thing was that like, we, I mean, you have to remember like one of their innovations, right? They bought Removed in 2014, by the way. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, and, and, and like they, uh, what was the name of this company that they bought, uh, you know, out in LA, that, 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 that created this idea of, you know, of having, the, you know, ads placed, right, but what, they, they bought them and that became the foundation of their business, but they made a huge change, which was, they used to intersperse the sponsor than the real results without telling you which was which, as a result you didn't, because they thought they would make more money that way, but, but then of course people didn't trust it, and Google said like, no, we're going to have a very clear demarcation between the two. So they had the right idea, but over time it has gradually, you know, dissolved and, and been, you know, become corrupted and and then they are setting up, you know, the, the stage for, for the next one to come along. Yeah. Well we're we're touching upon an area now that I think um, reminds me of, of something else. So yeah, so Google started out, they didn't have ads, but likely their VCs, their investors said, Well, we want you to, to make more money, that's why we, we gave you the amount of money that we did. Or to not lose money. <laughs> or, or to not lose money. And so I want to, to ask the question about, well, the financial incentives for decentralized technology. And I'm going to ask Marchin first because he's not in the software business. He's more in agriculture, heavy industry. It might be a, a little bit different. And I'm curious if the financial pressures, um, if they're different. And it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, Marchin, but you're kind of doing this kind of out of principle. You probably could be doing something that gives you a greater monetary return, but you seem to have a, a mission to deliver, you know, tractors and backhoes cheaply into the world. Yeah, we do things differently, so I'm not sure where to approach this question from. Um, the question being, what are the fi are the financial incentives here different than software? Like, how does this become possible? Well, well, they might be. I want to get get your kind of uh, your viewpoint from okay. someone who's in agriculture and industry. I think that because the I always think about hardware, like the world of open hardware. So this is a long winding answer to this question. It is going to be so much bigger. So, so we're talking about open source hardware versus open source software. The hardware world, that world has open source hardware has collapsed. It was like a brief blurb, maybe around up to 2012, when everything open source hardware was going up. Then we had things like the MakerBot debacle of closing up the world's leading open source 3D printer, etc. That world co world collapsed, but it's yet to be realized, and I think it is yet to be realized because the economic incentive is so much huge, more bigger. Hardware still runs, like all the software that we have, it still controls hardware, so I believe hardware is, and if you look at the economy, it's, I think we can safely say the hardware economy is still 80% of the, the real economy. Um, the idea there is that hardware, as I said in my TED talk, it, it can provide tangible needs in such a material way and therefore the benefit to the user can be much closer it's it's much my opinion is that so this actually goes back to what I want to ask Pedro and George like how do you see this vulnerability playing out in hardware because what I'm seeing as inevitable like right now Amazon you get your consumer goods from Amazon. Tomorrow, it will be open source micro factories fueled by global collaborative design. That I see as inevitable because it's more efficient, it's more distributive, and I can go on about the advantages. Um, and I think the, the core advantage is how the wealth can be distributed in a fundamental way uh, to average people who need a house, who need food, cars, 
and other things. So um, I'm not sure if it gets anywhere in, uh, to, to, to an answer here, but I see that the problem of uh, like the you know the billion dollar question to take over Twitter or uh, how much how how do you take down Google or whatever I think that is actually well that will, I, I do believe that will happen in, in hardware as in you no longer have even the Teslas or the Fords the cars but distributed production through open source micro factories worldwide thousands of these basically every million or hundred thousand population center has one of these facilities that produce locally in the in the fab city concept, cities produce all that they need, uh, the circular economy kind of context. Um, so I think that's a common and um, why, the financial Why are they more efficient? Hmm? Why are micro factories more efficient than mega factories? Uh, or why do you think they will be? I can look at it as, as I can build a tractor here. Uh, I looked at the numbers and I can, it costs me less and I can do it faster than a than a centralized operation through collaborative design builds, through swarming, through in terms of on the, on the design side, through modular design, on the production so what, why side. Why can't John swarm Deere builds. use your modular design in a mega factory? Because one of the properties we, we do is, is open source, and open source implies lifetime design. Lifetime design is end of John Deere. So we are on a totally different playing field. Does that kind of answer the question? Well, I guess I'm, what I'm asking fundamentally is like, is it cheaper to produce a factor in a micro or a tractor in a micro factory or a mega factory? Same tractor. If the designs are open source, they can both use. It. Is it the nimbleness that these small factories, I guess, provide that is the competitive advantage? It is the advantage that has been shown in software too, which is a collaborative core, which means your development and maintenance and development costs go to zero then you can focus on, on production. I mean, we are, so I've been at this for a decade, over a decade, and we have not delivered this. It's harder. It's probably about a thousand times harder than software because of the material aspects involved. But I can tell you where we're going right now, and that is with a CD go home. So right now, our first product, we're actually taking full to market. I mean, we've done things like tractors and 3D printers and CNC torch tables and things like that. But right now we're actually releasing the CD go home. So uh, a home that you can buy to either turnkey or as a kid that you can build yourself, that's lower cost by two to three, factor of two to three over industry standards. So how do we do it? It's optimal design, modularity, uh, all the aspects of good design and build just plain raw efficiency that's afforded by open source instead of a thousand different companies building houses or a million companies across the world or a thousand car companies across the globe. Imagine, could you actually get a better product if you all work together? The obvious answer is yes, theoretically. No one has shown this on earth yet, but that's where we're going. It's simply the, the raw power of efficiencies and quality design that's going to be the, the thing. I mean, a good example is uh, I guess we can go back to 3D printers where they, before RepRap, the open source 3D printer project, 3D printers used to be like $10,000, then RepRap came about and you can build one for $500. It's that same effect. But then you have to commercialize it, productize it, which is that aspect we're working on right now. So this is a territory that's not been explored uh, in the mainstream economy yet, but this is the, the coming thing. I think it's just plain raw efficiency and, and other aspects like modularity. <laughs> Lifetime design, which means instead of a product that lasts 10 years, it, it lasts as long as you like. It can be constantly upgraded with new modules, like say the tractor, like the, uh, or like a computer to which you add peripherals. Here, same thing, the house or the tractor to which you, which you can maintain or modify for life, and the user controls that. So there's just much more value there where you're determining the length and the quality of that product. You're much more involved in that uh, higher value creation. I think there's a very important factor here, which is customization, right? Yeah. John Deere can probably make a million copies of the same tractor more efficiently than you know a million you know farmers making each their own tractor. But once you want a different customized tractor for each farmer, uh, it's you know at least potentially the individual farmers have the advantage, provided that they have the tools to make things. Because among other things, they know what they want better, 
right? Why do you wait? Why do you want customization? No, I, I, when you don't always want customization, but you very often do. And when you do, is what I'm saying. When you want customization, then decentralized potentially has a big advantage sure. Uh, sure. because you know. Uh, and, and but you know we can do you know um, to, to go back to what Martin was was saying earlier. We can do this sort of experiment of saying like, you know, uh, suppose you have a world, you know, to oversimplify a little, in which everything you, you know, everybody has a 3D printer at home or in their building, and they can just make everything they want right there, right? Will this be the end of Amazon, right? Now, oh, potentially... because injection molding is way cheaper and faster and better if no, you're doing I... things at scale. Well, again, think about having the just customized... dealt with this. It's way better, like. Well, I mean, it's my point is that it can actually go both ways, right? Because there are things favoring one or the other, right? So it does make a lot of the so Amazon's one of their core strengths is the huge, you know, logistics, you know, network and expertise that they have, and that would disappear. This would make that disappear, right? So that puts Amazon in danger. On the other hand, a lot of the expertise that they have, more on the software level, uh, might even, you know. Their advantage compared to, for example, Walmart would be even bigger in such a world. Uh, you know, they would be the company that provides all the software and maybe even the 3D yeah. printers and like, you know, the organization and so on to, to let people do this. So if you look at a lot of these, you know, tech giants and also, you know, organizations, you know, uh, of all, of all uh, uh, scales and types, they often have a wave of, let's say, technological change that they ride on, right? to establish themselves. And then they have a few more that they are able to adapt to. You know, like uh, often by scrambling. Like Microsoft, you know, they rode the wave of PCs and they just barely managed to adapt to the internet. And Facebook, you know, managed to just barely adapt to mobile, right? Facebook could have died when mobile came along. They almost did, but they didn't, right? And now they dominate, right? But there will sooner or later be a wave that they failed to adapt to. Right? And I think there will sooner or later be a wave that Amazon fails to adapt to. It could be this wave where things, you know, just you know, become more and more made in the home or not, right? And again, there's people at Amazon who, you know, whose job is to think about things like this and try to be ahead of them. What often happens, and again, this is the downside of centralization, is that there, then there are people, you know, it's that saying, I don't know if you've heard this, that like any company large enough to have a research lab is too large to listen to it. <laughs> right? So, so they could fail even though, you know, th th there are people who inside them who see what should be done. But the, at that point, the forces, you know, for the status quo inside the company are too large. And of course, there are mm -hmm. countless examples of big fails like this. And Regardless. Again, Mm -hmm. Regardless of, of like which companies specifically succeed or fail, I see software and hardware as being very different because software has zero marginal cost. The cost to replicate software is zero. The cost to replicate a tractor will always be something. And to use 3D printers as an example, sure, we went from the $10,000 Stratasys era to the RepRap open source era to the, the best 3D printer is now $1,000 from China era. And it's not open source. Yeah, you can go. You can take this discussion further because we're actually going down to materials like like part of the facility that we're building here. Is we're gonna do concrete, steel, silicon, aluminum from dirt. Crazy. Well, I can uh, initial on the paper. It looks like a million, about a million dollars for each of those infrastructures. But think about that craziness. So we're saying we're not gonna only digitize the designs, but now we're gonna make the processes of extracting the materials from abundant resources much cheaper. So for example, we can definitely kill off plastic recycling to get free filament for products that now sell for at least like a dollar a pound starting from trash plastic. We can recycle steel, we can do other things, but the point is if we go down like this zero marginal cost route, we see that yes, the cost does go down if you start getting more efficient, more localized, more more circular economy, more open source about the production aspect. So, so the costs go down. They won't go down to zero because you have to have capital, you have to have infrastructure. But for us, it's that, hey, with this about $5 million, about 20,000 square foot facility, we're going to be able to do all those things down to, here we're making silicon and microchips. So that's 
uh, it's not too far out. I mean, technology is getting better and better. It's miniaturizing. So we're kind of thinking, okay, what's can you actually show that, yeah, you can create advanced civilization on, on very small scales. That's, that's my take on it. It's, we haven't seen anything of what technology can do. My, microchips are actually a very interesting example, right? Because microchips are what makes all of this you know, this how, you, how, how are you making microchips? And, and they, but, but, you know, just to finish that thought, there are a few things more centralized now than microchip production. Yeah. Right? Because the cost of the fabs is so high, mm -hmm. right? It's like tens of billions of dollars. So over yeah. time, all you have is fewer and fewer of them. Yeah. Uh, but, but this is, this is the case, like, uh, wait, wait, George, you're actually you're making, asking, you're, how the hell are have, we Have you made microchips? a microchip yet? No, no. Yeah. This is where, uh, I know one kid in New Jersey who did it. But no, but take, take a look at this. Look at look at the arguments here. So, uh, you go down to you got steel. Then you enters precision machining and grinding. You got precision parts. You can either even do air bearings on a lathe that's the size of your desktop. So now you've got space age technology, high vacuum pumps. We've got buildings from our compressed earth blocks and dirt. And you're talking about that billion dollar fab facility might now cost us a hundred million or one million but definitely for one million we can get at least the technology to do things like arduinos or perhaps raspberry pis or or uh, beagle bones and things like that so that's that's the general idea any technology can be scaled down to uh, a very small scale if you because if you look at the the, the fundamentals of civilization you're, you're looking at okay you got ball bearings you got air bearings you got precision parts and then it all kind of goes from there. But any of those processes, they're like a desktop machine, like a precision machining center to in which you can make engines for everything. Or even like 3D printers, like Tesla print, 3D prints their rocket engines now. Um, yeah, there's huge uh, infrastructure required to support it, but you can really, really push the limits of how small that can be, and, and especially if it's an integrated ecological system. Not like a thousand different companies doing a thousand different things, but an integrated product ecology that allows you to do that. So modular product ecologies, open source, uh, interoperable, that gets us to, to levels that we haven't thought of before. I want to bring up something Pedro uh, brought up earlier, which is factors that favor either centralization or decentralization. So what, what kind of favors, what factors point to one or the other? And if well, you don't like that question, you could uh, say if you could snap your fingers and remove some barrier to decentralization, what would it be? Well, we've, we've touched on a bunch of them so far, right? So, uh, and, and, and there's more, but um, again, you know, without going back over those, I think one uh, thing that, that I think Marcin briefly touched on, but I think is very important, is this question of competition versus cooperation, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, and again, what you actually have most of the time in most domains is not pure competition and not pure cooperation. Is actually have what sometimes is called coopetition. Right? It's a mixture of competition and cooperation, even among competitors. You know, companies that like you know the stories like oh they are each other's throats. Less visibly, they're often cooperating because they actually. You know, so think of you and me, right? You know, as two companies or two people, right? There are areas where we have common interests, and therefore it makes sense for us to cooperate in them. And there are areas where we have opposite interests, and therefore we must compete. And now the, you know, the, I think the larger mm -hmm. picture is that, like, you will get, you know, uh, more centralization or more decentralization depending on 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 how much, how powerful each of these is. And what often happens is that. You know, we, uh, um, is that, again, people always see competition and co cooperation as opposites, as competing forces, but ironically, in many ways, it's the opposite. It's that competition is the mother of cooperation. <laughs> it's that we cooperate, the six of us, or, you know, or, or four or five, uh, in order to compete with some other number of people that are doing something, right? And, 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 and what happens is that that, um, I mean, let me give you a very concrete example. Afghanistan, right? <laughs> Afghanistan is like, uh, uh, 
remarkable in the fact that they have been, and, and they say this about themselves, they are always at war. The only question is whether it's with an external invader or with each other. <laughs> when there's an external invader, they get, you know, they are very good at actually fighting wars, right? This is actually the most pathetic thing about what happened with the U.S. there is that they learned this, you know, uh, they, they, they managed to bring learned helplessness to the, to the Afghanistan war fighters, right? They, mm -hmm. they have such practice at fighting with each other, right, that when, because when there's no external threat, it makes sense for them to fight with each other, right? So they are decentralized. When there is an external threat, like, you know, Britain or Russia or America or whoever the next one might be, then it makes sense for them to cooperate so that they have critical mass to, uh, you know, to face down that external threat. And once that external threat is faced down, they go back to fighting with themselves. So, and I, I think this is an example of something that goes on in a lot of different arenas, right? And then as the cost of different things changes, you know, the competition, you know, changes more towards you know, larger co cooperation, smaller, but uh, but that's I think the the axis along which you have to look at this. Are we seeing more cooperation amongst innovators in the decentralized spaces? We're seeing more cooperation. I mean, this is the magic of the internet, right? Is that it has made cooperation on a scale, not just in terms of numbers of people, but like my ability to find someone to cooperate with me across the world, right? is something on a different scale than it was before, right? And so this really does create, you know, an opportunity for an exponentially larger number of connections to make, right? Think of this in terms of game theory, right? And of like finding non-zero games to play, right? The, the, the internet makes it possible to find way more non-zero games to play than before, right? Some of those non-zero games will be like small trades, you know, like I make something on Etsy and you buy it, right? Some of them will be will cooperate on some open source piece of software, like like you know you start Linux and I start, you know, I contribute something to the kernel and whatnot. But some of those, you know, if you continue this logic, you know there'll be a power law where some of these corporations will wind up being incredibly large things. They wind up also being incredibly centralized because you know they, there's benefits to the centralization. So so the internet did create the, this enormous opportunity for more collaboration, some of which will be small and some of which will be on a very large scale. And and you know, and, and they may change, right? So, you know, to go back to the Amazon example, one of the main threats to Amazon today is Shopify. Right? Shopify actually is a very interesting threat to Amazon from this point of view because they are less what Shopify does is that they just provide the service to you, the merchant, right? You still, you know, the consumer doesn't even know about Shopify, which for me, the sellers may be better because things are under my brand name rather than Amazon's. Right? I'm unfamiliar with Shopify. Can you briefly describe it? Yeah, so Shopify is this Canadian company that came out of nowhere and is now you know, a really serious threat to Amazon. We, we, we use them. I love Shopify. Yeah, and they're, you know, they're like, a, you know, in the tens of, you know, billions of dollars company at this point and, and, and growing rapidly. What Shopify does is it, it provides to you if you are a merchant of anything and you want to go online, it provides to you all the tools and all the infrastructure <laughs> to sell your goods online under your own brand name, as opposed to Amazon that says, you will sell these things on Amazon, right? So in a way it provides to you, you know, all the goodies that Amazon does without the downside of like, oh no, Amazon is taking control and they're mining my data to compete with me and whatnot. All of those worries that merchants, you know, <laughs> justifiably have about Amazon, you know, Shopify makes them go away, which is precisely why it's grown so much, right? So Shopify is a more decentralized version of Amazon, which maybe now makes more sense for the for the merchants, right? And therefore is growing. Well, one of my one of my big questions is um, basically about uh, VC funding and. You know, if I'm a venture capitalist, I want to invest in a company that can grow to be massive, that has a nice moat around it. Uh, and so I would think that there's not a whole bunch of venture capitalists um, perhaps beating down the door of Marchin uh, trying to give him funding. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that. But from what Pedro just said, perhaps there's enough of a market for people who are I don't know, fed up with the Amazons of the world to make investing 
in alternatives lucrative. Right. I'm curious so, I mean, if you could talk a little bit about that. I don't know if you've heard this concept of the kill zone around the tech giants, right? The kill zone around the tech giants is supposedly this zone of things that are uh, uh, that VCs won't invest in because the threat from the tech giant is too great, right? And if you do this, Amazon will come and squash you, or Apple, or Google, or whatever. Therefore, we're not going to invest mm-hmm. in it, and and then you can, all, and which is a shame, right? Because then then there's less innovation there, and then the people lose out, right? And and then outside of the kill zone, things that look distant enough from what the tech companies are doing, then those maybe can grow more and, and have funding. And maybe one day, one of them will grow to be a threat, one of the you know, those tech companies. But, you know, inside the kill zone, life is very hard, right? And and the thing about this concept of the kill zone is that it's a very popular one, but there are so many exceptions, right? Again, Shopify is a good, you know, this, Shopify started as a very small startup. Right, so you can actually be right inside the tech giant's kill zone, and yet still be able to grow and defeat it. Right, and part of this is the moat. Right, you know, you know, you can have a moat uh, that makes you hard to dethrone, but the, but in the world of software and the internet, moats are damn hard to maintain. Right, and the thing is, if you're, you know, again, if Google starts, you know, pestering people too much with ads, then companies that don't do that will, you know, will, will be on the upswing. Right. So, you know, at, at, at the end of the day, I, I think, um, you know, if you're the VC, right, you, the reason you need, I mean, having moats is always good, but, but the reason why a moat is essential is that you are going to sink a lot of money into this company, like say Uber, right? Tens of billions of dollars have been sunk into Uber uh, in the short term. This is only worth it if you're going to make a lot of money over 10 or 20 or 30 years. Otherwise, it's not worth. Otherwise, it won't pay off, right? Because there's this, you know, discount, uh, uh, you know, factor, you know, for the future. So if they, if you don't see a potential moat there, you're probably not going to invest in that to start with, right? Uh, or, or or a big network effect, or and, and, or, or some combination of the two, right? And you know, for example, you know, to to take the example of Uber, it was never clear that they would have that much of a network effect because you know, every city is a different story, or every country, or every market, and that very much has played out, and, you know, <laughs> you know, like, and like, say, Google or Amazon, Uber has not, you know, made a ton of money for its VCs, despite the huge amount of investment that went there. So, so moats are important, but they, I think, are, are increasingly hard to find, which, if you believe in decentralization, is good, right? Nothing protects centralization more than a good moat, and by the way, you know, a, a, a state is basically an organization with a moat provided by an army. <laughs> right. <laughs> At heart, that's what it boils down to. George, I'm curious uh, about like your to... perspective on this. Uh, can I point oh, out I'm something? On. Can I point out something? Oh, though, March like... and go for it, and then George, just so you yeah. can get your answer ready in your head. Yeah, it was about basically VCs and uh, right, yeah. decentralization. Yeah. Uh, Marcin, the... you're about to say something? Yeah, back to the missing link. Like Pedro, you're saying that. Uh, competition is the mother of all co- cooperation under the assumption of scarcity so in our world if I were to point to one block to to the the next better future is that assumption of scarcity that is not enough for everybody and yes that's how everybody thinks but we really should be considering seriously how we teach people an abundance mindset, not some hippie ideals. I'm talking about raw productivity, responsibility, freedom, all of that that's required, the discipline required to get to cooperation, to an abundance mindset. That's that's what's missing because in our project, when I did the TED talk, whoa, this was like flooded with all kinds of interest and then what happens? Nothing. At the end of the day, uh, we have not gotten a single collaboration. This kind of gets into this VC capital stuff. No collaboration on, on open source projects. Like you'd think that the entrepreneurs would be after this, but no. Uh, I think the the scarcity mindset is there. How are we going to make money, right? So that's definitely in a way. And we're saying, well, we still believe that um, un- until the point where we think that we cannot succeed with better product, crowd development, collaborative design. At that point, we might turn to VC capital, which I doubt, because I'm pretty convinced that this is going to work. But we, I'm open to revisiting that. I want to change the world with uh, open collaboration. 
Uh, but I think the the raw productivities of what we're trying to do, the, the simple collaboration, I mean, it's, it's a basic, it's been proven in software. Why will it not apply in hardware? That's, that's our thing. And of course, it's been kind of co-opted in, in, uh, in the software in terms of all the centralized platforms with a common core. The ideal does not exist there. But because the, the results can be so much more tangible and, and felt by average citizens, uh, there, I do believe there's a, there's a good chance of success in hardware. It's also very challenging, as I mentioned, but there is a, there is a potential of success. Okay. Excellent. And then George, um, so you're, VCs, you're excited about VCs, yeah. Yeah. Look, we've raised eighteen point one million dollars. We just raised ten million dollars at a five hundred million dollar valuation. It is laughably easy. Um, the trick is to have no ideology, and then to build something that's better than something that already exists. Right? Investors are so desperate for anything that's even slightly better. You know, we build this thing. It's open source. It's legitimately better than everything else on the market. Consumer Reports says it's the top eight ass system. And then, like, you know, the VCs who are interested in how's it going to make money, well, you don't get to invest. Sorry, bro, you miss out. Oh, I'm, I'm missing out on something? Oh, how do I get in? How do I get in? Oh, now you want to get in. No, 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 you're not the right type of person. You like people who get it from day one. I don't think investment is, is hard if you're actually capable of building anything that is at the frontier of... Uh, of, of, of like where things are I, I found you know yeah like 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 if you if you say like if you build something you're like well this is clearly better than everything else on the market um you know it doesn't matter what your business model is it's just better investors will invest right but that's uh, contingent upon you being the only seller in the future well, if you're, if no. you're doing what Marchand does and basically gives away what you made for free, we give it's away less, what we make, less attractive. We give, away, we give away what we make, too. I don't think that matters. We're the factory that made them. We're the goose that lays the golden eggs. Give all the golden eggs away you want. Everyone's investing in the goose. I, I think that there's so much capital out there today that if you can tell a story like this, um, it just, you know, shows up. If you tell a story about how, like, you know, I don't know. I mean, like, I, I, it's laughable when I see all, like, the social good stuff, and, right? The investors try to hide behind this, like, oh, we're doing it for social good. I'm like, no, 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 no. We are ruthlessly capitalist, and we're going to give our stuff away. Why are you going to give it away? Well, because capitalism as it's played today is mostly a zero-sum game, right? Do we want to make a billion dollars, or do we want to destroy a hundred billion dollars, which is worth more? Um, um, and I Talk a little bit about that. What do you mean well, by, with that last part? So, like, if you can give something away, right, that other companies were planning to rent seek on for $100 billion, and I mean, actually just rent seek, produce no more value, just rent seek for $100 billion. If you can take that out of the economy, that might benefit you more than making a billion dollars personally. Right? And that's, if you can get people to start believing that mentality, that's like, it's not about how, let's say you go look at the PVP loans. The PVP loans are a perfect example. Would everybody like to give their PPP loan back in exchange for uh, doing away with the inflation we've all seen? And I think almost everyone would say yes. Right? So were PPP loans a good idea? No. Right? And it's the same way with the with the economy today. If you can if you can pull things out that are effectively just huge money sinks or just really inefficient allocations of capital, that is better for you individually than making capital yourself. Tell us how you actually but do I that, George. Uh, wait, sorry, say that again? Uh, well, how are you actually doing that? So so can you be more specific? So are you talking about the self-driving car software? or? Mm -hmm. So we have we have, we have have ADOS software uh, right now. It's on GitHub, the free open pilot. Um, it's competitive with Tesla Autopilot, mm -hmm. better than everything else. And there's companies that are trying to, you know, companies that have raised hundreds of millions, even billions in some cases, that have inferior software to us. Mm -hmm. Right? Those companies, well, what, are, what can they possibly offer? They can offer nothing, right? And they're not going to be able to raise rounds in the future if investors ever start actually doing any sort of due diligence and being like, wait a mm -hmm. second. Imagine, imagine somebody today was trying to raise money for an operating system. People would be like, I'm not giving you any money. Look at Linux, right? Like, it's free. It's going to be impossible to compete. Um, 
and I think this is this is like the really wonderful thing about open source. It's not some hippie collaboration stuff. It's actually a competitive bludgeon that you can smash into large corporations and be like, bro, I just gave you shit away for free. I, I would I would push back though against saying that this means that capitalism is a zero sum game. On the contrary, it's a it's a positive sum game, and that's why it's powerful, right? If you take something that was a hundred billion dollar business and completely destroy it by making something better free, right? Well, yeah, the owners of that business lost their hundred billion dollars, but everybody on balance is actually better off, right? Yes. Between you and the buyer, you have gained more than the old seller has lost. So it's a positive sum game. In fact, I would say that what drives cooperation is, you know, that there's, including trade, right, is, is that there's a positive sum to be had somewhere. And that's really, I, at heart, what capitalism is all about. I very much agree that capitalism, as I like to think of it, is a positive sum game. I think a lot of this late stage capitalism stuff where you're seeing like SPACs and ICOs and Theranos is, is, is a zero sum game. Oh, or even negative. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah, I, I, exactly. Like, I, I do not think that, I think that in theory, if you truly had free markets, of course, capitalism is a positive sum game, but free markets don't mean unregulated markets. Um, you have to have some amount of yeah, preventing some certain bad effects in markets. Now, I think the regulations are actually making the whole thing even worse. They're actually benefiting the bad actors more than good actors. But I, I mean, um, in fact, uh, uh, you just brought up, I think, a really uh, a crucial point, uh, uh, which is the following, right? And it's true of a market. It's also true of, of a social network, right? Which is, on the one hand, you want as much freedom as possible, like, say, free speech on social media. On the other hand, or, and you know, you want you know, as much freedom in the economy and for people to do whatever they want. On the other hand, you do need to have some amount of rules to make the community work or it I, collapses. Yeah. So, and that, and I think, is precisely the tension between decentralization and, that, and centralization is that without those rules, things collapse. So, you know, they decentralize, but you're back in the Stone Age, which is not good, right? Mm -hmm. But without too much, you know, with rules that are overly strict then or overly centralized in terms of deciding, for example, what is misinformation and whatnot, then you actually kill the golden goose, right? So there's actually a very interesting balancing and difficult balancing act that a state has to do and the platform has to do. And, and you know, and I think it's just the general theme of this. I mean, yeah, everyone's got to get rid of the spam. Everyone wants some content moderation. Nobody really wants anarchy. And there will be different, you know, you know, look at Reddit versus Twitter, right? They have very different rules, and they, and they, therefore, they have very different roles, and, and vice versa. So the, the answer is not going to be the same for everybody. But I think in any platform, any market, any, you know, social organization, you are going to have a set of rules that have to be somehow enforced by someone with the power to enforce them, like the benevolent dictator of an open source project. And and, and, and 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 really a lot of the problem, the research problem, if you will, is figuring out what are the best rules, what is the best organization they have for, for whatever it is that you want to accomplish. Sure. That's a practical question. Can I ask George, can we use your, the, is it called Open Pilot? That, to, yeah. to drive autonomous tractors for work, for example, such as auto, automatically doing foundations or ponds on our land? You can certainly use some parts of it. So, uh, I'll, like, Open Pilot is kind of two things. There's some things that are very specialized to, like, on-road driving and following the rules of driving. But there's also tons of just, I mean, it's, it's like it's like ROS, but I think a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like ROS 3.0. We've built all of these core pieces of infrastructure for robotics. And most of them will run on smartphones, too. With, 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 with very little effort, you can get lots of the open pilot stack up and running on smartphones and then you can be streaming back cameras and IMUs uh, you know we have a nice uh, GPS localizer all built into the thing that I think can definitely be reused uh, for tons of other applications we think of open pilot more like an operating system for robotics than just a self-driving car you know the product we're coming out with uh, next month is the common body it's a you know it's a it's like the Tesla robot but not as fancy um, but yeah, so tons of parts are usable, but just straight up taking open pilot and running it. No, it'll look for lane lines and it'll look for, you know, a lead car. Well, George, on, on Marchin's behalf, I'm inviting you out to Marchin's farm in, uh, in Missouri, and you could both learn a lot, and then you can come, I would, you can go back 
to Southern California and use what you learned to, to start your farm? I, you know, I've, 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 I've looked into your stuff. I, I would love to go. Um, yeah, I have. I, I bought some land 30 minutes east. Oh. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in this stuff. The thing that I always come back to that makes it really hard is my lack of slave labor. Um, I don't have slave labor, right? Like, who will yeah. dig the well? Well, I can get a well digging machine, but who will operate the well digging machine, right? I need slaves. Um, now, you know, I'm not a believer in enslaving humans, uh, as most people today aren't, but, you know, I'm a believer in enslaving robots. So, first build yeah. slaves, and then the land will be really nice. You know, who's going to make my bed? Who's going to wash my sheets? Well, the robots will. Yeah, no, that's, sure. that's, yeah, that's exactly it. I, I mean, it's a struggle for us here. I mean, we did that, you know, I, I know the pain of what that was like. And now, we have, I mean, one innovation on a social front is actually the swarm builds that we did, we do. So that's without robots, like the house that I'm in right now, for example, we built with 50 people in five days. So there's a swarming route, but I would love to have some digital and robot assist in that whole process. And that's that's our whole but thinking to make this You're doing house. it largely with, with, with volunteer labor. Uh, the model is... Uh, uh, there's one, one aspect like the of this is education. Uh, one aspect of this is education. The other part is that we're we're producing real homes for real clients with a with a team of 24 uh, apprentices who are paid staff in a learning program. So actually, we've got a whole other aspect of how we actually educate and train the people for this. Because one of the big big deals <laughs> is talent. Everyone talks about talent, right? Well, for us, we have to have diversified skilled people um, in our operation. Like when we build a house, the person does everything from the foundation to the roof. Like no, no trades. It's a it's a generalist kind of a skill set, and then you can get into the design and enterprise aspects. But we are training people to do that, so we can actually put people in the workforce to do this for others, as a, just a plain uh, commercial business model with hundred percent open source behind it. I I think it's cool enough that there'll be tons of people who just want to learn this stuff right yeah. and i think this is true i'm surprised you know I, i'm not sure i could use the exact trick i used with investors for hardware yeah. i think i would have a hard time getting around the zero marginal cost issue i'm like look man we're gonna make open file it's gonna be 10x better everyone's gonna use it or die it's gonna be like android because it has zero marginal cost you can make a 10x better tractor but that doesn't mean everybody's gonna switch because mm -hmm. there's a large switching cost um that's yeah. that's not just that's not just an NRE, it's recurring expense, right? They'd have to redo their whole supply chain, you know, just, just like the machines to build hardware are expensive. The compilers to build software are open source and free. Yeah, but we're, our thinking on that is you can push that quite a bit, as I mentioned, like if we're actually just take even the very simple thing of recycling plastic with high temperature 3D printers for pr printing all kinds of objects. You've got free plastics, not not injection molds, well, but slow, but slow stuff there. You have or to use a metal. lot of intelligence to sort the plastics, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's the problem. It's intelligence. Recycling in general, the more intelligence you can apply to recycling, the more efficiently you can do it, right? Yeah. It's very easy to throw an iPhone in a vat that melts out all the precious metals. It's much harder to reuse the screws. Yeah. Because you're going to need something very intelligent to remove the screws without damaging them. Yeah, so uh, with AI and robotics, I mean, this becomes all feasible. Like, we've done calculations here like, oh, can we actually compete with a, with a mega steel mill if we do a 200 kilowatt induction furnace here? And yes, we said that we'd be about 50% of the steel production cost if we do that, like, on site on a small scale. So those And you have slave are, labor. No, that's built in. That's built into you're that. Building a, you're building your labor costs. All right, cool. Building in the labor costs. And then think about, now that's with people, and think about automation, so now robots and AI and stuff like that makes it really feasible. So, I mean, we're extremely optimistic about just um, taking the zero cost or cl as close as we can get within hardware. Because once you can digitize, like Diamond's seven Ds of disruption thing, once you can digitize it, you can do everything to it. And it starts with uh, just digital designs and then algorithms, and then you can have robots and kind of becomes almost a zero, zero um, marginal cost thing. And Pedro, I didn't, I didn't mean to be rude. Also, on Marchin's behalf, I'm inviting you to his farm <laughs> sure. in Missouri if you ever want to go. Sure. Yeah. Um, Thanks. I'm, I'm curious if you were, so, so the listeners who, who are are listening to this they might be thinking all this sounds cool but what can I as a listener do I'm curious if you had any advice 
for some some standard person listening to this, what type of things would you tell them you might want to think about learning X, Y, and Z or go into X, Y, and Z? What, what would your recommendations be? Well, I mean, that's the question that always bothered us. And our final solution right now is we're creating immersion education programs to that. So basically starting with six-month apprenticeships, down to eight-year PhD level courses where you become an open source ecologist like I. But the idea there is that uh, this requires a diverse skill set that you're not taught in school. So when I got my PhD in physics, I thought I knew it all. I got out, out to a piece of land. I got my ass kicked. So there's a lot of diversity. That's how I feel. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a huge diversified skill set that you completely don't get in school. And starting with thinking, mental models, psychology of how to become a whole person, the psychosocial integration like Radical Man, the classical book, all that kind of stuff. You gotta learn that. How do you transcend your mindset of scarcity? So for me it's been a, well, all these years have been, the technology works, that's the inspiration, but then getting the skills to manage it, it's, um, but that's, that's what we're actually at this phase right now. We're creating, uh, we're rolling out the apprenticeship program this year and then the deeper immersion education. So if you want to go, instead of going to college, learn how to do real things and build the future that you want, come here. It's not here yet, though. And you can apply through that through your website, I believe, right? Yeah, so the apprenticeship, we, we don't even have this up yet because we're just going to announce that we're, you know, we're, um, we're still not there yet. So, but do take a look at our stuff on the website. That's where we're going towards immersion education as, as our core. So we're combining the education slash production model because for the kinds of things we build, we need integrated workforces, integrated skill sets. And Pedro and George, what, what would you recommend a listener look into? Well, I, the first thing I recommend is, and you know, not necessarily in this order, but like figure out how you want to make a positive difference in the world, number one. And then number two, find like-minded people, right? Because doing it all by yourself, you know, will probably limit the impact that you can have. And then number three, right? Figure out how do you want to organize yourselves, right? And, you know, don't be constrained by the, uh, you know, by the existing norms, right? There's an enormous space today of, you know, deciding to be organized in different ways for the thing that you want to do. And, and uh, you know, there's no recipe because if there was, you know, people will be doing it already, but there's a lot of, you know, other examples you, you can look at. L let me just give you this, you know, slightly higher level thought. I think an ideal society is a society in which you have, I don't know, you might call it radical self-determination. Is Any subset of people could tomorrow decide that, you know, we 50 or 100 mm -hmm. or a million of us are going to now operate by these rules among us. And mm -hmm. nobody can tell us not to. Okay, very different from what exists in the world today. And then of course those, let's say million people or 100,000 need to figure out how to interact with the rest of the world, right? A little bit in the way that, you know, countries make treaties with each other and, and international conventions and whatnot. And maybe like, you know, if you're in America, let's say you could have some default rules by which you operate according to American law or whatever. But I think this is the way, this is, I think, what the internet makes possible. Yeah. And this is, I think, what from the point of view of like human flourishing is most desirable, is that like everybody find, figures out how they want to impact the world, they find the like-minded people, and then they organize themselves in whatever way they see fit. And nobody else can tell them not to. Yeah. George, go for it. Uh, go on GitHub, find an open source project you like, submit a pull request. The maintainer will tell you if it's bad. If it's good, they will be excited. Uh, and if they are excited and you get it merged, go do this again. Do this for four years, and you will know more about how to program than any graduate of any CS program on average. Right? Like, the, you know, and that's what I love about the internet. It's like there's no more excuses. Go out there, you have a computer, you have GitHub, download VS Code, it's free and go contribute to some software. And then, you know, do this for four years and you'll find that you're really, really good. Now, all the stuff that uh, we've talked about the past couple of minutes, is the USA the best place to do this? The worst, is there some other country that's kind of like the Wild West 
of technology where you know all the all the dissident technology folks are going to move to I don't know I live in America uh I like knowing that no one's going to you know shoot me and uh food gets delivered to my house I live in a nice apartment I don't know how much location matters I think the USA is still the best place to do this uh again the beauty of the internet is that you really can be anywhere in the world and make, you know, big contributions if for example you find the right piece of software to write. But uh the the ex and and you know and you can gather information from all over, right? So so in many ways it does, it has made uh, for a more equal playing field. So maybe the difference is small than it used to be. But 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 at the end of the day there's still a lot of other things around that like, you know, how easy it is to do a startup, how easy it is to get funding how easy it is to you know to be free and not get repressed and not have to operate within arbitrary constraints that satisfy somebody else's agenda and i think overall america is still the best place to be you know i'm from europe you know europe has some strengths but i don't think it can quite compete in this respect and i think if you look at china for example in many ways china from a tech point of view is a wild west but in many ways it is not and 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 in many ways is actually getting worse and worse so for the time being i think it's still the us in fact what i would say is that we are still too dependent we humanity on america we would be much safer because things can go wrong here too and they are going wrong with things like wokeism and 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 what not and so we are too dependent on america we'd be much safer if we had half a dozen americas around the world and that's one with hope you know China would be an Europe and Africa and Latin America and what not and, and maybe it will happen although uh, assuredly not in the short term. Yeah, I agree. Decentralize America. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> and of course open source can help it spread the word. People ask me all the time uh, why don't I build tractors in Africa and and my response is well here we have the stability of if we can't make the economic model work here, we're not going to make it work in Africa. And in Africa, it would be much harder to go through the development process without the resources available like here. Right. Um, Pastor, I don't know if you have any questions. But if not, I was going to just say thank you to yeah. these three. And I want to uh, open the floor for any, any last words from, from all three of you. Let's see how we can collaborate. And I, I think. That could be something very positive, and if if any of uh, you three collaborate with each other, we would love to hear about it. Mm -hmm. All right. I think so maybe one 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 parting thought yeah. uh, is you know uh, not a new one, but I think a very uh, positive one here is just Alan Kay's. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. So my advice to everybody is like go out there and invent the future. Yeah, absolutely. And George, we'd love to follow up with you on automation of vehicles of all kinds, from tractors to cars and aerial vehicles. Pedro, do you see any any potential collaboration from what you know about us? Or uh, I do. Uh, I see. You know, uh, I see a, a great many. But I also, you know, you know, I realize that I have very little expertise about the things that you do. So I would, you know, refrain from just saying like, "Oh, there's A, B, C, and D." Right? I think I, I would have to learn some. Before before being able to make those connections in a you know in a useful way. Mm -hmm. Well, when you go out and visit the farm in Missouri, exactly, you can see if you have any insights. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I'm I'm very excited to visit the farm. You know, learn some things for my land. I know a lot about software and getting it to run practically. So it'll probably yeah. be helpful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, my my parting words are literally no excuses to anybody who's listening. Go on GitHub, check out a project, see what they need done submit a pull request put time and effort into it it's like the gym you know you put in time and effort you get gains you slack off you don't uh, get hub yeah, gains go. get hub gains go get them go get them today go through right. motivation and uh and and Martian, last word to you yeah yeah let's let's collaborate a very fascinating discussion uh, i hope uh, we can follow through and some further contact Excellent. Well, this has been wonderful. I think that maybe the world actually will have changed because of this. At least I'm crossing my fingers. Uh, you can just just tell everyone where you can find you. So, will Pedro, George, Marchin, where they can find you? And um, yeah, thank you so much. This has been great. Yeah. 
for us, opensourceecology.org. You can see the contact info there. You can take a look at my four-minute TED talk. It's still a very good introduction to the kind of work we do. And George? Uh, Common.ai is my company, github.com slash geohot, if you want to submit pull requests to any of my projects. And uh, Pedro, what's your spicy Twitter account that uh, everyone should follow? Uh, yeah, it's at PMD Domingos, and, and I'm also on the web at uh, PedroDomingos.org, or just you know Google my name. Excellent. This has been fantastic. If there's any collaboration that comes out of this, you'll be sure to come back and, and share it with us. Thank you so much for your Thanks time. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Guys. Thanks, guys. Take care. All right. Have a great day. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. Yeah, and if we're the recording has stopped. Oh, March in, yes. Password. Yeah, uh, did you guys send, send uh, the other people's uh, contact info through email? Or so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, do you, do you want to give me your uh, email address and I'll send it to George? I can, you I put can, it? I can get you that. Oh yeah, give it to me, I'll send it to George. I don't yeah. know if George wants to like keep his secret or whatnot, but uh, we'll, we'll, yeah, Pastor will give it to me, I'll give it to George. He sounds excited. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's keep in yeah. touch. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks a lot. This was this was great. Great discussion. Covered a lot of good topics. I think this is this is a first for us with the sort of panel discussion. So this has been really great. Thank you for helping. Yep. Thanks so much. And right. uh, yeah, enjoy enjoy Missouri. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> I know it can be often a violent weather out yeah. there. Um, and so maybe George will have to come in a, in a time when it's more suitable. He's used to the, the, the Southern California weather. Yeah, yeah. But it'd be great if everyone could, could get together. Yeah, no, I mean, with George, I mean, if we, I mean we've talked a lot about autonomous tractors, like, like real things like, okay, here's your tractor that you can either control from your desktop or just autom automatically does things like your foundation, which are heavy work on the body. It's that slavery work. So, yeah, I mean, there's, we talked about right. automation a lot. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much. And yeah, have a great day. Okay. Have a great day. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.